In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Today I'm going to talk about something very significant. I'm going to try to make it fast and very, very interesting. What you're going to get at the end of this is whether you are on one side or the other, because I'm not going to take sides, but if you're on one side or the other, you'll have, I want you to try, try, try to put your side, yourself in the other side and see uh, maybe the, the reason that why people choose that method instead of your method. Okay, what are the two things? There's follow a mazhab versus follow a hadith. The perspective I'm going to take is a historical historical one. How did these two methods develop? It's interesting though because if you read the Quran, the Quran says we created everything in pairs. And so now we have a pair within the ummah of how, what is the method, the, the two basic methodologies of to derive a hukum, to derive an understanding of what should we do. One method is, let's look at the hadith books. One method is, look at the mazahibs. Now, you may say to me, well, the mazahibs take from hadith too. And actually, that's historically not correct. As you'll see, uh, in terms of the sasit that we have today and other aspects of that, which I'll come to, let me start by mentioning this. Just follow along with me, okay? It'll become a lot easier. And all I want you to do is to understand the historical perspective of how these things developed. Okay, and I'm going to give you the the advantages of each side in a, in a, from a historical sequence perspective. Okay, um, so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he passed away in 632. What? 632. Okay. Then you have the fatawas of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. By the way, I have lecture series on my YouTube channel on the fatawas of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. And Ali, uh, Abu Bakr passed away 634. Okay. Because remember, we're taking a historical look at this, okay? So if you have the patience to be with me in this, you'll learn a lot. Ali radiallahu anhu passed away in 661, okay? Now, the Imams come into the history, Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik particularly, because one thing before I talk about them is that the, most of the Khulafa were in Medina. Medina was the city of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, okay? And uh, these... And then Ali moved Darul Khilafah to Kufa. And when Ali moved to Kufa, thousands of companions moved with him. And so Kufa became like the second Medina in a sense, right? Even our uh, Hafs, Qur'a of Hafs, for example, uh, is from Kufa. Our Qur'an, most of the Qur'an that we read, uh, Hafs bin Asim, is from Kufa. Okay? So Kufa and Basra, Makkah and Medina. You can say these were like the big cities where a lot of the companions were in terms of... so. The way that they were praying in Medina, in the, in the mosque, and the way they were praying in Kufa, and the way we had janazas in both places, the way we were doing business transactions in both places, the, the way we were handling the issues of the cities, the divorce issues, the, um, all the other human activities that were happening, right? Following the Sunnah of the Prophet, the way we did our Jummah khutbas, the way we did our Eid khutbas, everything was being done in both cities from in Medina from the time of the Prophet, of course, and then till the, the Khulafa that were there. And then they, a lot of the companions moved to Kufa and they set up the same system. Okay, And so it's not so much about this Imam or that Imam. I'm giving a historical sequence. Okay, In fact, the proper way to say Abu Hanifa, for example, is the school of Iraq. And the, school, and the proper way of, you know, well, the school of Medina. Imam Malik is the school of Medina. It's not really about a person or his fiqhi issue because these people were surrounded by who? When early on when you were in Medina, for example, Imam Malik, right? He was surrounded by the children of the Sahaba, the children of the Sahaba, same thing in Kufa. Okay, whether it's Ibrahim Nakhli or before that, even if it's, uh, you know, uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud or even Ali radiallahu these were, they were the children of the Sahaba, the students of the Sahaba that were there. So Imam Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa are significant in a sense uh, that they had an opportunity to actually see things from the children of the Sahaba, their perspective, and they were they they heavily took into consideration, like almost like if you take Ibrahim Nakhli and Imam Abu Hanifa, their fatwas and compare them, there's almost no difference. There's like maybe one percent difference. Okay, if you take Hamad. Uh, and and Ibra, uh, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, no differences. Okay, so imagine you're you're now okay. You're in the city of Medina, a hundred and Imam uh, Abu Hani, uh, Imam Malik dies. Uh, sorry, Imam Malik dies seven hundred ninety-five. Okay, so 
uh, Ali radiallahu anh died 661. Okay, 100 years later, Imam Malik dies. So he is there about 50 years of, he has an approach to the people that had, that were there with Ali. Okay, 50, 60 years. So now, you know, the, the, the normal chain of narrations from Imam Malik to the Prophet is about three people. Like from Ibn, Ibn Umar to An-Nafir to Imam Malik. Three people, right? Same thing with Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa is actually a little bit earlier, right? Whether he was a Tabi or Tabi Tabi, but he was around this time, right after the Khulafa. And he had, they both had access to the children of the companions of the Prophet this is why Imam Malik had an opinion, and I'll ask you, you tell me in the comment section, this is the answer I want you to answer in the comment section today. For if you're Imam Malik, and all the children of the Sahaba in Medina are doing one thing, and you hear a single narration or narrations that the Prophet did something else, what would you do? Now remember, you listen, you have your shayukh, you have your teachers, you have the people that you love, they teach you the deen, you, do what they, you grow up doing what they say, right? So here it is. Imam Malik's opinion was, it's called A'mal al-Madina. His opinion was, the children of the Medina is more heavy in weight and opinion than a single uh, narration of a hadith, even if it's authentic. And there are many examples of this in the Maliki school. Okay? And you'll find many examples of the same situation in the Hanafi school, even though Imam Abu Hanifa did not make this a, like a rule, a qanun, uh, or... or of his, uh, of his, uh, of his fiqh. It's not a, it's not a ruling that I, I will definitely listen to the children of the Sahaba over a hadith of the Prophet in the Hanafi fiqh. But it is in the Maliki fiqh, and you can understand why because the children of the Sahaba were right there, and Imam Malik considered it an ijma. If all the children of the Sahaba are doing one thing, then why am I going to listen to a hadith which, which doesn't, you know, it's 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 not living, it's not giving you the same level of context. Right? So, Imam Abu Hanifa died in 167, uh, sorry, 767, Imam Malik dies in 795. Now, the person in between is Imam Shafri, because Imam Shafri studied with both. He studied in Medina, he studied uh, with the school of Iraq, Imam Abu Hanifa. Now, Imam Shafri tried to resolve this problem. And so how did he resolve it? You know, when you read his uh, Kitab al-Um, his Kitab al you read his books, you'll find that, okay, so you have Makkah and Medina, Kufa and Basra. You have Hassan Basri, right, for example, in Basra. You have other great scholars in Basra and Kufa. These were two garrison cities built by the Muslims, okay? And Kufa was the Darul Khilafa also, so many companions were there. And then you have Medina where there were many companions of the Prophet Now Imam Shafri is studying with both. And he's like, how can I resolve? I mean, these are the two big cities of Islam. In terms of knowledge, these are the two biggest cities. And so Imam Shafi says there's only way, one way to resolve this. Okay? And that is to collect, have a collection of hadiths, a proper collection of hadiths. Now remind you, all this time hadith collection is going on. It's not like, oh, there was suddenly a new uh, writing of hadith. That's not what happened. The sahifas were there, but the science of hadith was not yet formulated properly. Okay? Just like before Imam Abu Hanifa, the fiqh was already there in the time of the Khulafa, but it was not formulated in the same way as afterwards, right? It didn't become like a complete, a proper science. So Imam Shafi'i is the one who called for, and this is why you'll see, you know, Imam Khali left the Shafi'i Mazhab towards the end of his life, but Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, al Ibn Majah, all of these. Uh, great muhaddisin, may Allah have mercy upon them, they were what? They were Shafi'is. They followed the Shafi'i fiqh. Okay? And you'll, this is why also, for example, in Muwatta of Imam Malik, you'll find, for example, that there's a hadith that's quoted the same as hadith in, the, in, this, in this period, later period, but Imam, Imam Malik's fatwa is something else. For example, about the Trawi prayers in Ramadan, in the Maliki fiqh, it's 36. But he has, in his Muwatta, he's recorded that the, uh, that, uh, that the Tarawi prayers are 11, right? Um, this becomes a very interesting subject, a very deep subject, okay? So Imam Shafi'i is the one that pushed, you could say, the, the, that we need to collect the hadith so we can resolve this uh, Medina and Kufa 
conflict because he had studied with both and he understood both and he tried to come up with a fiqh that kind of resolved both of the issues. Okay. Now, Imam Malik dies in 795. Imam Bukhari dies in 870. Okay, the first of the Muhaddisin. Imam, Mal Imam Muslim 875. Mu Ibn Majah 887. He's the last of the six. Okay, so there is from the time of Ali to Imam Bukhari more than 200 years distance. Okay, from the, uh, the death of Abu Hanifa to Imam Bukhari, there's almost a hundred years difference. So the chain of narrations to Imam Malik, when there's a chain of narrations, is three people. When there's a chain of narrations to Imam Bukhari, you're looking at at least five people to seven to people to even nine people. Okay? So, the, the, so what happened is the Mazahibs were formulated early on. The, the Hadith literature came in later. Okay? Now, now, over here I want to mention Imam Shafi'i dies 820. Okay, so right in between these two phases. The, the phase of developing fiqh. And these were not the only two people. There were, Imam Lais was there. Uh, Thufyan al thodi was there. Uh, 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 there were so many other fuqaha that were there that had their mazahibs developed already in this phase. Okay, and, I'll get, and then Imam Bukhari. Now, so the problem with the hadith... Uh, the hadith chain is that it's longer, meaning the Prophet said The best of the generations is mine, the Prophet said. Then those that follow them, and then those that follow them. Okay? So when you look at it in from this hadith perspective, right, it seems like these people have the upper hand. Because they were closer to the Prophet, they were closer to the companions of the Prophet. So if the Dalil is coming from a mazhab, the advantage it has is that it's closer to the time of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. What's the advantage this group has? The biggest advantage this group has is that they have a chain going back to the Prophet. This group is relying mostly, Imam, and Imam Shabani Allah Muhaddas Dilbi Rahmatullah in his Hujjat al Balila, he mentions this, that Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik basically relied on the children of the Sahaba. They relied on the Tabi'een. Okay, and the those people who saw the Sahaba, they relied on them mostly. So this group relied on this group. Okay, but this group relies mostly on the first, meaning the Prophet himself, sallallahu So the chain goes back to the Prophet. Over here, it goes back to the companions of the Prophet, sallallahu Over here, it's it's not. The individual, it's not an individual, it's the companion of the Prophet as a whole within the whole city. How are they doing something? So you could say this group looks at the whole city of Mac uh, Medina and Kufa mostly because Basra and Makkah are also part of this. And this group tries to go back to the Prophet. Now, I have a question for you. If you are Imam Malik, right? If you are Imam Malik, and you're in Medina, and you have access to the children of the Sahaba. And somebody tells you hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that, what? That goes, that you didn't hear about, or that you didn't hear about from the children of the Sahaba. You don't see them practicing it, right? You don't see them practicing it, and you hear hadith. Are you going to go with the hadith or the children of the Sahaba? Are you going to go with the ijma of the, the consensus of the children of the Sahaba in Medina itself? Or are you going to go with the same hadith that you have verified the chain, you think it's authentic, but... Now you have to decide. You know, there are also things that you find, for example, in the Mazahibs, you don't find in the Hadith literature. And there are things in the Hadith literature you find that you don't find in the Mazahibs. For example, just as one example, and then I'll end because I don't want this to become too, li too long. And uh, that is, for example, uh, raising your uh, izah, your pants, you can say, uh, over your ankles. Now you find this in the Hadith literature with very authentic narration, right? But you don't find it in the time period of the formulation of the fuqaha, of the fiqh. Another one that's very, very interesting now. See, now this is very interesting, and I'll end with this, and I'll end with that same question I had. Is that Imam Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa, both of them, both Kufa and Medina, both agree. There's no Rafaya then. The, the Raji Akol in, in, the, in the Maliki fiqh, as well as the Hanafi fiqh, is that even though it's allowed, better not to do Rafaya then. Rafaya then is, you've probably seen people 
uh, raise their hands to their shoulders, as mentioned in the hadith, and then they go into ruku, and then when they come back, they raise their hands again. This is how, but Imam, can you imagine this? Can you imagine this? I'll tell you why this is so strange. Because if you look at the hadith literature, there are more than 300 sayings of the Prophet to do rafaya then. How can you not do it? The Prophet said, the Prophet did it. But Makkah, uh, Medina and Kufa didn't do it. So the children of Medina were not doing it, which was closer to the Prophet. And the children of, uh, of Kufa were not doing it, which is closer to the Prophet But when you look at the Hadith literature, the evidence is overwhelming. What are you going to do? So I ask you now. You're in Medina. You're Imam Malik. You're sitting in Medina. The people of Medina are not doing Rafa'i then. Okay? They're not doing Rafa'i then. And this is the interesting part. Sometimes these same children will narrate the Prophet did this, but their city will be doing something different. That is a longer discussion. I'll maybe go into that one day. But let's just stick with this. Let's say you're in Medina. You're in the position of Imam Malik. The children of Sahaba are not doing Rafa'i then. And somebody brings you a collection of, let's say, 100 hadiths that say, look, the Prophet did this. What will you do? Imam Malik would say, no, I'm going to go with the children of Medina. That's my rule. Because if it was really that important, then they would have known about it. So, this is one reason why we're divided. is because one group is with the early formulation of fiqh, and the second group is in, in, the, in the desire to be authentic. In the desire to be authentic, and to take directly from Muhammad sallallahu and directly taken from the Prophet they, they have a chain of narrations, but this chain of narrations is generally five to seven people. But Imam Malik, you know, his chain of narration is generally three. And they had the formulation of fiqh. What are you going to do? So if you're Imam Malik, and you go with the children, children of the Sahaba, or you're going to go with the Hadith literature? So at least, maybe you have a better appreciation, not about the differences...